There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. The mystery of the presentation of Jesus in the temple which is also the mystery of the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is an invitation to renew our baptismal vow to be holy and to offer to God acts of virtue, especially acts of obedience to God, that we may become pleasing offerings to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In this mystery, we contemplate also the mystery of the consecrated life in the Church. The Feast of the Presentation of Jesus is celebrated also as World Day for Consecrated Life. Instituted by Pope John Paul II in 1997, it's a day of gratitude, reflection, prayer for men and women religious, says Pope Benedict XVI. In the encounter between the venerable old man Simeon and Mary, a young mother, the Old and New Testaments come together in a wonderful way in thanksgiving for the gift of light. On the day when the Church commemorates the presentation of Jesus in the Temple, we celebrate the day of consecrated life. In fact, the Gospel story to which we refer is a significant icon of the giving of one's life by those who, through the evangelical councils, have been called to bear witness in the Church and to the world the characteristic features of Jesus, chaste, poor, and obedient, the consecrated one of the Father. On today's feast, we therefore celebrate the mystery of consecration the consecration of Christ, the consecration of Mary, the consecration of all those who commit themselves to following Jesus for the sake of the kingdom of God. 
According to the intuition of Blessed John Paul II, the first to celebrate it in 1997, the day dedicated to consecrated life assumes some particular aims. First, it responds to the need to give praise and to thank the Lord for the gift of this form of life, which belongs to the Church's holiness. Moreover, this occasion is intended to highlight the witness of those who have chosen to follow Christ through the evangelical councils by promoting knowledge and appreciation of consecrated life among the people of God. Finally, the day of, for consecrated life is intended especially for you, dear brothers and sisters, who have embraced this condition in the Church as a valuable opportunity to renew your intentions and revitalize the sentiments that inspire giving of yourself to the Lord. As we meditate on this mystery, let us contemplate how Mother Mary had offered herself at the Annunciation. Forty days after the birth of Jesus, she now offers a pair of turtle dove in the temple to redeem Jesus, her firstborn. And in 33 years, she would offer Jesus on Calvary to redeem humanity and a sword would pierce her soul also. Consecrate to me all the firstborn, said God in Exodus chapter 13. This was to acknowledge that by the strength of his arm, God brought us out of Egypt. And to remember how when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to obey God and let the people go, God slew all their firstborn. Dear friends, we too have been presented to God, consecrated at baptism, at our religious profession, at our ordination. What does consecration, being presented to God, mean to me? Do I live as one consecrated, as one belonging entirely to God? Mother Mary desires to offer me with Jesus to God. Am I willing to be offered as victim to redeem souls? As religious who are consecrated entirely to God, as we pray this mystery, let us also practice the art of offering to God our daily acts, virtues, sufferings in reparation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. To offer today at least three acts of love, virtue, suffering, to save souls. In his homily on the Feast of the Presentation in 2019, Pope Francis says, Fully five times the Gospel speaks to us of Mary and Joseph's obedience to the law of the Lord. Like Jesus, whose food was to do the will of the Father, and who became obedient unto death for us, to progress is to lower ourselves in obedient service. It is curious how it is not young people who are led by the Spirit who become creative or prophetic. The young, Mary and Joseph, follow the law of the Lord, the path of obedience. The two elderly, Simeon and Anna, however, docile to the Holy Spirit, they are led by the Holy Spirit. In 2017, Pope Francis warned us religious of the temptation of survival. He said, an evil that can gradually take root within us and within our communities is the mentality of survival. This mentality makes us reactionaries, fearful, slowly and silently shutting ourselves up in our houses and in our convents, in our own preconceived notions. It makes us look back to the glorious days, days that are past, 
and rather than rekindling the prophetic creativity born of our founder's dreams it looks for shortcuts to evade the challenges knocking on our doors today a survival mentality robs our charisms of power because it leads us to domesticate them to make them user friendly robbing them of their original creative force it makes us want to protect spaces buildings structures rather than to encourage new initiatives an environment of survival withers the hearts of our elderly taking away their ability to dream in this way it cripples the prophecy that our young people are called to proclaim and work to achieve how do i move from a survival mentality from a maintenance mode to mission mode how can i move from law to the spirit from observance of tradition to prophetic living out of the charism of the founder how can i move today from a survival mode to zeal for souls mode dear friends we need to be patient and courageous to keep advancing exploring new paths and responding to the promptings of the holy spirit Let's listen to Pope Francis. Now the homily Pope Francis has prepared on this 25th celebration of the World Day of Consecrated Life, the feast of the presentation of the Lord. Simeon, so Saint Luke tells us, looked forward to the consolation of Israel. Going up to the temple as Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus there, he took the Messiah into his arms. The one who recognized in that child the light that came to shine on the Gentiles was an elderly man who had patiently awaited the fulfillment of the Lord's promises. Let us take a closer look at the patience of this elderly man. For his entire life he had been waiting, exercising the patience of heart. In his prayer, Simeon had learned that God does not come in extraordinary events, but fulfills his works amid the apparent monotony of our daily life, in the frequently dull rhythm of our activities and the little things that Working with tenacity and humility, we achieve in our efforts trying to do His will. By patiently persevering, Simeon did not grow weary with the passage of time. He was by now an old man, and yet the flame still burned brightly in his heart. In his long life, there had surely been times when he had been hurt and disappointed, yet he did not lose hope in the daily patience of a man who, despite everything, remained watchful until at last his eyes saw the salvation that had been promised. And I ask myself, where did Simon learn such patience? He received it in prayer and in the history of his people who had always seen in the Lord a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and fidelity. Simeon's patience is thus a mirror of God's own patience. More than anything else, the Messiah, Jesus, whom Simeon held in his arms, shows us the patience of God, the merciful Father who keeps calling us even to our final hour. This is the reason for our hope that God never gets tired of waiting for us, unstintingly gives us the courage to start again. And now let's look at our patience. It is not simply about tolerating difficulties or 
showing grim determination in the face of hardship. Patience is not a sign of weakness, but the strength of spirit that enables us to carry the burden of personal and community problems to accept others as different from ourselves, to persevere in goodness even when all seems lost or useless, and to keep advancing even when overcome by fatigue and listlessness. I would like to point to three places or settings in which patience can become concrete. The first is our personal life. In our lives as consecrated men and women, it can happen that hope slowly fades as a result of unmet expectations. We have to be patient with ourselves and Await in hope for God's times and places, for He remains ever faithful to His promises. That's the, the rock. He's faithful to His promises. The second setting in which patience can become concrete is community life. Human relationships Human relationships are not always peaceful, especially when they involve sharing a project of life or apostolic activity. We all know this. There are times when conflicts arise and no immediate solution can be expected, nor should hasty judgments be made. Space is required to step back, to preserve peace, and to wait for a better time to resolve situations in charity and in truth. Our communities need this kind of reciprocal patience, the ability to support, that is, to bear on our own shoulders the life of our brothers and sisters. Finally, a third setting is our relationship with the world. Simeon and Anna cherished the hope proclaimed by the prophets, even though it is slow to be fulfilled and grow silently amid the infidelities and ruins of our world. They did not complain about how wrong things were, but patiently looked for the light shining in the darkness of history. We, too, need that kind of patience so as not to fall into the trap of lamenting, complaining, and some are teachers of complaining. It's like they have a doctorate in complaining. Brothers and sisters, let us contemplate God's patience and implore or ask for the trusting patience of Simeon and also of Anna so that our eyes, too, might see the light of salvation and bring that light to the whole world. Our founders were moved by the Spirit. They were not afraid to soil their hands in daily life with the people's problems, going with courage to the peripheries. They had a healthy restlessness to take Jesus to people a healthy restlessness to take Jesus to people. This was the invitation of Jesus himself to Mother Teresa in 1947. Jesus said to her, My little one, come, come, carry me into the holes of the poor. Offer more sacrifice, smile more tenderly, pray more fervently, and all the difficulties will disappear. You are afraid. How your fear hurts me. Fear not. It is I who am asking you to do this for me. Fear not. Even if the whole world is against you, laughs at you, your companions, your superiors look down on you, fear not. It is I in you, with you, for you. Now let me act in you. Trust me lovingly. Trust me blindly. Dear friends, let's ask ourselves, 
Am I carrying Jesus to people in my mission? What fears are keeping me back? How can I let Jesus act in me more and more? As we said, this mystery also celebrates the purification of Our Lady. Purification of a woman after childbirth as required by law in Leviticus 12. Our Lady tells St. Bridget of Sweden, I did not need purification like other women because my son who was born of me made me clean. Nevertheless, that the law and the prophecies might be fulfilled, I chose to live according to the law. Proverbs chapter 20 says, What man can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am purified of my sin? There is no virtuous man on earth who, doing good, is ever free of sin. Let us therefore ask Our Lady, Queen of Purity, to teach us to conquer every sin. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to breathe upon us that we may be holy, consecrated. Please join me now in renewing your baptismal consecration to God with the following prayer of St. Bernard. O Lord, I willingly offer you my sacrifice, since you freely offered yourself, not through any need of your part, but for my salvation. I have only two poor possessions, O Lord, my body and my soul. How I wish I could worthily offer you these two pittances in a sacrifice of praise. It would be better, much better for me to offer myself to you than to be left to myself. In fact, if I remain alone, my soul is troubled. But in you, my spirit is exultant as soon as it offers itself to you in complete dedication. Lord, you do not wish my death. Shall I not then freely offer you my life? In very truth, that is an offering which pleases you, a living offering. Peace.